Remember from immunology that T cells recognize protein antigens and then display those to B cells to activate class switching and antibody production. This concept is used when designing vaccines, taking a small protein subunit from a bacterium and using it to activate the immune system. When it comes to encapsulate bacteria that have polysaccharide antigens, however, the polysaccharide antigen is poorly immunogenic. Therefore, conjugating or linking the polysaccharide antigen to a protein antigen tricks the immune system into recognizing the antigen and forming antibodies against the polysaccharide. This is how vaccines for strep pneumoniae, the pneumovax vaccine, H. influenza type B, and Neisseria meningococcus have all been developed. Urease is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis of urea into carbon dioxide and ammonia. This characteristic of H. pylori forms the basis for the urease breath test as a diagnostic tool. Patients swallow radioactive urea and the detection of isotope-labeled CO2 from the patient's exhaled breath indicates that urease-producing H. pylori bacteria is present in the stomach and has split the urea into CO2 and ammonia. Other bugs in addition to H. pylori, which have urease, include Proteus, urea plasma, nocardia, cryptococcus, and klebsiella. These bacteria produce a unique pigment when they are grown on agar, which aids in identifying them. Actinomyces israelii can be distinguished by its yellow sulfur granules. Staph aureus has a more universal yellow pigment, Pseudomonas has a blue-green pigment, and Serratia marcescens has a red pigment. These mnemonics here can be helpful in remembering these. These features are important ways that bacteria avoid being cleared by our immune systems. Staph aureus contains protein A, which binds to the FC portion of antibodies. This makes it impossible for opsonization and phagocytosis by macrophages and neutrophils to occur because they also attach to the FC region, which is now unavailable. Several organisms can cleave Ig antibodies using IgA proteases, which eliminate our primary antibody method of infection clearance in the respiratory tract. These organisms can be remembered by the Shin mnemonic, which stands for Strep pneumoniae, H. influenzae type B, and Neisseria. M protein is strongly antiphagocytic. We will encounter the importance of M protein again when we talk about group A strep and rheumatic fever. Review this table to understand the basic differences between exotoxins and endotoxins, but the most important difference you should know is that endotoxins are found only in gram-negative organisms within the outer membrane, while exotoxins are proteins or polypeptides that are secreted from bacteria and which can have a variety of effects depending on the target. This is an extensive list of the mechanisms by which exotoxins function, many of which will be covered again as you move through the chapter. Let's start with bacteria whose exotoxins act by inhibiting protein synthesis. Corynebacterium diphtheriae and all those bacteria identified in this chart with an asterisk produce exotoxins which are known as ADP ribosylating AB toxins. These toxins have two components. A B component facilitates the binding of the toxin to its target host cell. The A subunit is the active component which will attach an ADP ribosyl group to the host protein, which effectively alters the protein's function. For example, the A subunit of Corynebacterium diphtheriae toxin attaches an ADP ribosyl group to the elongation factor of its host cell. This leads to the clinical presentation of diphtheria with gray pseudomembranous pharyngitis. Much like Corynebacterium, Pseudomonas attaches an ADP ribosyl group to the elongation factor of its host, thereby inactivating host protein synthesis. Keep in mind that the asterisk marks other toxins that fall in the ADP ribosylating category. These other toxins we'll discuss in a second, but include heat labile enterotoxigenic E. coli, Vibrio cholera, and Bordetella pertussis. These are AB toxins which attach ADP ribosyl groups to G proteins to alter their function. Although they each function a bit differently, the end result is activating the release of CAMP. Cyclic adenosine monophosphate, CAMP, is a second messenger molecule made from ATP by the enzyme adenylyl cyclase. 
Adenylocyclase is activated by stimulatory G proteins, known as GS, and inhibited by stimulation of inhibitory G proteins, known as GI. Next of the bacteria which inhibit protein synthesis, we have Shigella and Enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Shigella produces Shiga toxin. E. coli O157H7 releases Shiga-like toxin, which also inactivates the 60S ribosome subunit. But unlike Shigella, does not actually invade the epithelial cells of the colon. Both Shigella and E. coli O157H7 can cause HUS, or hemolytic uremic syndrome, by stimulating cytokine release. HUS is a very serious complication, particularly associated with enterohemorrhagic E. coli infections, that presents with the triad of renal failure, hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Next are bacteria which increase fluid secretion. E. coli heat labile toxin and cholera toxin both overactivate stimulatory G protein, which activates adenylocyclase and increases CAMP production. Yersinia enterocolitica exotoxin causes bloody diarrhea via invasion and destruction of colon epithelial cells, leading to diarrhea. Yersinia acts by the same mechanism as heat-stable enterotoxigenic E. coli by overactivating guanylate cyclase, which then causes an increase in CGMP levels. Bacillus anthracis toxin is also known as edema factor. Like pertussis, cholera, and E. coli labile toxin, it also acts to increase CAMP levels. However, this toxin is unique in that the toxin itself is adenylate cyclase and continuously produces CAMP without having to be activated by a G protein. Next is a bacteria which inhibits phagocytic ability. Bordetella pertussis also results in adenylate cyclase stimulation by attaching an ADP ribosyl group and inhibiting the G protein that normally shuts off adenylate cyclase. The result is increased CAMP levels, which inhibits phagocytosis and provides for the prolonged survival of Bordetella. Finally, we'll talk about bacteria whose exotoxins inhibit release of neurotransmitter. Clostridium tetanized toxin blocks the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters, GABA and glycine, from the Renshaw cells of the spinal cord. Renshaw cells are inhibitory inner neurons found within the gray matter of the spinal cord. Without inhibition of motor impulses, unimposed muscle contraction and spasm occur. Clostridium botulinum toxin also blocks the release of a neurotransmitter. In this case, it is the release of acetylcholine from presynaptic nerve terminals and causes a floppy paralysis. Look for other anticholinergic signs, such as patients complaining of blurred or double vision, difficulty speaking or swallowing, droopy eyes, muscle weakness, or GI symptoms such as constipation. The paralytic effects progress in a descending fashion. Both Clostridium tetani and Clostridium botulinum toxins function by cleaving snare proteins, which are required for the release of neurotransmitters from the presynaptic terminal. Next are bacteria which lyse cell membranes. Clostridium perfringens produces alpha toxin, which is a lecithinase. Lecithinase is a type of phospholipase that acts upon lecithin, which is a generic term for fatty substances found in tissues. Clostridium perfringens alpha toxin can therefore necrotize tissue and destroy blood and vascular cells by cleaving cellular membranes. Strep pyogenes can produce two exotoxins with different mechanisms. One exotoxin is known as streptolysin O, which is a hemolysin. This means that the toxin can kill red blood cells and aids us in identifying strep pyogenes if we see complete lysis of blood or beta hemolysis when strep pyogenes is grown in blood. Our body will make antibodies against the streptolysin O antigen, known as anti-streptolysin O antibodies. Diagnosing rheumatic fever requires identifying that there are ASO antibodies in the patient's blood agar. Strep pyogenes can also produce a toxin known as a superantigen, and is therefore listed again under our next heading, superantigens causing shock. Superantigens bind directly to MHC2 and T cell receptors, activating large numbers of T cells to stimulate release of cytokines such as interferon gamma and interleukin 2. The figure below shows how a superantigen bridges over both the MHC2 receptor and the T cell receptor. 
Exotoxin A of strep pyogenes can cause a toxic shock-like syndrome. Staph aureus also produces a superantigen known as toxic shock syndrome toxin, or TSST1, which results in toxic shock.